Hallelujah. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're live from Odessa, Florida. Hallelujah. This is our, our uh, uh, first session on buying without money. We're going to do a series of sessions uh, on that subject. This is a book. We have a book that I wrote called Buying Without Money. If you're watching and you'd like to have the book, I'm happy to send it to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm happy to send you the book. I'll send it to you directly. I'll pay the postage. You just let me know your uh, address where you want it sent, and we'll send it to you uh, absolutely free of charge. Because the information is so important that uh, I'd like to get it out. I'd like to get it out to you. Uh, we wrote the book because it was a skill that we had to develop ourselves in. Uh, we found ourselves in a very, very difficult uh, financial situation a number of years ago, basically because the economy failed. At least it failed in the arena of which we were working with. Actually, they called it the Great Recession, um, as opposed to the Great Depression in the 30s. It was the Great Recession. It was by far the, and it, it occurred in approximately 2008, 9, 10, or thereabouts. And it was the most significant depression that our country, or recession our country had faced since the Great Depression of 19, late 20s, late 20s, early 30s. And, um, as a result, uh, what we found is the business that we were in, we were unable to work, we were unable to produce an income in that business, and uh, it was necessary to produce money some other way because we had obligations, we had commitments and things that we had to do. We had people who worked for us, and, and even you know, and when, when we reduced our operations as far as we could, we still had a couple people that worked for us for some period of time. So we had to pay them, we had house payments, or you know, we had housing bills, we had food bills, we had expenses of our children, automobile bills, and on and on and et cetera. So the reality was that we had no uh, opportunity for the flow of money to completely stop, because uh, there were things that we needed to buy, but what we needed to begin to develop ourselves in was the ability to buy without money. And uh, it was, and, and I assure you, it is completely a spiritual exercise. And uh, let's start with, um, let me read you the scripture. This was a foundation of scripture because I had studied this scripture for some period of time and I was well aware of it and was well aware of what it said, but I wasn't really schooled or developed in the process of buying without money. And so I went back to this scripture and let's read it. It's Isaiah 55. Verses 1 through 3. Ho, everyone who thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you in the, even the sure mercies of David. So that's a prophetic utterance from the book of Isaiah. Once again, Isaiah ch uh, chapter 55. And he calls it buying without money. Now we have a covenant with our God. And we, at the time, we were, we were tithers. We still are. We, we have been uh, since the my wife and I, I got married many, many years ago. We were both tithers before we got married, and we have continued that process on since then. And, you know, there is a covenant of the tithe, and the covenant of the tithe is this, that he will open the windows of heaven over you, he'll pour you out blessings you've not room enough to receive, and he will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Those are powerful promises, and note they're promises which you have no capacity to perform on your own. For example, how could you rebuke the devourer, you know? I mean, you have no authority to do that outside the authority that was given you by Jesus Christ. So we determined that it was necessary for us to learn how to buy without money. So that's the foundation of how we got over to the process and how we began to study the, the uh, scripture. There are a couple of other relevant scriptures, and uh, one of them is 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 4. Whereby he has given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that we be, be partakers of the divine nature. It's a powerful scripture. Now, what he's referring to, what the Apostle Peter was referring to in that book, 
was the law of God or the word of God. And the word of God, depending upon how you look at it, you could look at it as the law, which it is, or you could look at it as a set of promises, which it also is. You know, quite frankly, the word of God is basically an if-then equation. If you do this, then this is going to happen. If you do that, then that's going to happen. If you tithe, for example, we were just talking about that. If you tithe, then these are the things that you're, that you're going to get uh, as a result of that. He's identifying the process of sowing and reaping. Now, the foundation to buying without money is that you exercise spiritual law to acquire things, to buy things. You're using spiritual law and not natural law. Under natural law, we live under what we call a monetary system. And basically, the monetary system identifies the value of things by money. In other words, it uses the whatever the monetary value of it is to measure what it's worth. And it's worth so much money. And that's how it operates in, in the monetary system. Well, the difference between the monetary system and God's system, God's system is the process of exchange or sowing and reaping. And everything in the kingdom of God, including your ability to buy without money, those things are going to operate according to the principles of exchange. In, in other words, I'm going to exchange this for that. I'm going Amen. to, uh, and now God expanded that yeah. process, the process of exchange, by what we call sowing and reaping. In other words, the idea behind sowing and reaping is not exactly the same as the process of exchange. In sowing, what you do is you take something of lesser value and you plant it, much like a farmer, for example, will take a seed. A seed is of, 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 of low value and he'll plant that seed, but the seed will grow up and become greater. It'll get bigger, it'll grow into a harvest. The seed planted will grow into a harvest and that harvest will have value. Where the seed had little value, the harvest might have great value. So the process there then of, of sowing and reaping is, is uh, a, an element of the principle of exchange. It's just that you're exchanging one thing for something that's not worth very much or something that, let's say, is not worth very much under the monetary system. You're exchanging that for something that will have a greater value or will become of a greater value. Now, um, just <coughs> so we don't move off, off that topic, the principle of sowing and reaping is, is, is also called seed, time, and harvest. Now, there's three elements involved in that process. Seed, which is what you plant. Time, which is the process between the uh, when you did your planting and when you do your reaping. And uh, then uh, harvest is the end of the process where that seed has grown up, it has matured, it has become greater, and, and there you have it. So. What God allowed us to do in his infinite wisdom and, and in his uh, uh, love for us, basically that's what happened, was, it was because everything God did was because he loved us. And it was his love that motivated him to give us the process of Amen. sowing and reaping, the process of seed, time, and harvest. And actually he begins to identify that in the first book of the Bible, Genesis 20, uh, 126. Uh, he begins to identify dominion, and he begins to identify the process of sowing and reaping, and uh, that process carries through then. When the earth is destroyed and all the living things in it, except for eight people uh, and the animals, uh, meaning Noah and the ark, when the earth is destroyed except for those people, what God did was he reaffirmed when he came, when, when Noah came out of the ark, God reaffirmed that process and he said, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. There will be sowing and reaping. So that process continues on. That is foundational to buying without money, is the ability to use seed time and harvest, the ability to use that process. And um, then in over, and we'll come back to the scripture again because it's a powerful scripture, is Mark 4:14. 4, the sower sows the word. The sower sows the word, making reference to the word of God, making reference to uh, Jesus Christ as the word. The sower sows the word. So seed time and harvest, what he's saying in all those scriptures is that seed time and harvest or sowing and reaping or planting and growing up and becoming greater, 
That's God's process that he uses. It's the process he uses in the natural realm. And it's also the process he uses in the eternal realm or in the supernatural realm. It works in, it will work in heaven as well as it works Amen. here because it is an eternal process and it's God's process. Amen. And so this buying without money, what we're going to talk about here, the buying without money, it's, it's, it's foundation is in sowing and reaping and seed time and harvest. And again, I want to just, I want to go back and reiterate the process once again of sowing and reaping. The idea is like in an agricultural setting, you take and you plant a seed which has little value, there's very little value, and that seed grows up over time and it becomes greater and it becomes a harvest at some point, which is of much value. So the idea is we may not have the harvest we're believing for, we may not have the things we're, we're believing for, but we have a seed, we have something that we can sow. Now, the process of buying without money means you're going to sow with something, but you're not going to sow with money, but it's not necessarily money. And I want to reiterate here, and it's in the book, and once again, we're happy to send you the book. Uh, we also have it under on our website, christianfinancialpublishing.com, which you can look at, and uh, you, can, you can actually get it off there for a couple of bucks and download it immediately and uh, have it in your hands uh, immediately. But that that process of sowing and reaping, that process, it doesn't mean, to buy without money doesn't mean that you'll never need money. It doesn't mean that you'll never require money. It just means you don't start the process with money. Amen. So let's say you wanna, there's something that you wanna buy. We're, we're for example, we're, we're farmers and we're in the real estate business. In our farm business, of course, we want to have trees that we can sell, we sell trees. And so we start with seedlings, we buy seedlings, we plant the seedlings in, in the soil or in whatever the, the uh, uh, material is that, the, that, the, that it's gonna grow in. It might be the ground, it might be a pot, it might be some sort of fertilizer or something like that. But we plant that seed, of, which is something of negligible value, and it grows up and it becomes greater. You know, I used to tell my children, because we had our children at one time, you know, we were so financially constrained that our children had to help us be the ones who planted the seeds. And I used to tell them, you know, you're not handling those little seedlings that you're handling. You're not handling a seedling. You're not handling a tree, a baby tree that's worth 50 cents. You're handling a $100 bill because that little seedling is going to grow up and it's going to become a $100 bill at some point. It's going to take a couple of years. It's going to take some labor. It's going to take some process. It's going to take speaking over it. It's going to take sewing over it. But it is going to grow up and become a $100 bill at, at some point. That's the process of seed time and harvest. Now, so the idea of buying without money means that it doesn't mean that you're never going to need money. It's just that you don't start with money. You, you begin with a process. And uh, the process, the, 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 there is a, 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 an underpinning to this process of buying without money. And the underpinning is faith. That faith is absolutely required because it is a principle of God. And whatever principle that God establishes is going to require faith. Because the word says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. For we must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There is nowhere where that is more important, where that statement is more important than in buying without money. Because, you know, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you follow his principles, you follow his process of sowing and reaping, his process of buying without money, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This process of buying without money, it will require a couple of different things. Number one, it will require you to believe it's possible. If you don't believe it's possible, it won't work. Um, you have to be fully persuaded that it is possible to buy without money. The second thing is you have to be developing your faith to apply your faith to it because the entire process works by faith. And... Uh, uh, Romans 3.31 is one of my favorite scriptures. It's where the Apostle Paul is talking about the difference between the natural realm and the supernatural realm. And what he says is, is does, does, does faith make void the, the law? 
Does faith make void the promises? No, faith establishes the promise. It's faith that makes the promise work. If you don't believe it and you don't have faith in it, it isn't going to work. No, it might work for me and not for you because you didn't believe it. And that is a that is the substance of what we see in Christianity out there is very few people are buying without money because very few people believe that that process will actually work. And in fact, what you'll hear people say, I, I hear this all the time, is, well, it may work for you, but it didn't work for me. Well, if you say it didn't work for you, it's not going to work, which leads us to the, you know, the, the, the next element, which is your confession, your words. Your words are critical because we live in a word-based system. And what you're going to see here as we move forward is that your words are what you plant. See, if, if you're believing God to uh, produce something, something without money, or you're believing God to produce something in the, uh, uh, of a supernatural nature, what happens is, particularly if that thing is tangible, let's say you want to produce a business, or you want to produce finances, or substance, or a car, or whatever that thing happens to be, or a car, or a house, or whatever it is that you need, you, you, and, and you want to produce it, you will require two elements, because what you're looking for is a manifestation of the thing in the natural realm. Let, let's use a car for an example. That's, that's a good example. Let's say I believe in God for a car, and I don't have a car. So what do I do? I want to sow for a car. Now, I want to sow a natural seed for a car because the car, I want the car to manifest in the natural realm. But I want it to manifest quickly. I want that seed to grow up in super, with supernatural speed. I want it to grow up with supernatural value. I want it to grow into to, to a car. Uh, and maybe I have no money, but I need a car. So I, I want to sow for that thing. The situation that I just described requires two things. It requires a manifestation in the natural, and it requires a spiritual impartation. It requires God to touch it. In other words, we need God to touch that seed because I have no seed that is worth a car. Right. In other words, I'm believing God for a car, but I don't have any seed that's worth a car. Um, but if God touches it, if God decides that the value of what you sowed Amen. was worth a car, you got the car. That's how. That's how. That's how that process. Uh, that's how that that process works. So the foundations then is that you must believe the promises. I mean, you have to you have to believe that God has for you to buy without money. Um, you have to use your faith. And you uh, have to control your words. You have to be very, very careful the things that you say. Um, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. He that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That Nowhere is that statement more true than the area of your words. In other words, your words, your, uh, 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 and one of my favorite scriptures is Philippians, I believe it's Philippians 4.2, where the apostle says, uh, Paul, he's writing to his converts, he's writing to his partners in Philippi, and what he says, he says, I refuse to speak in respect of want. I refuse to speak in respect of life. If you're believing God to manifest your ability to buy without money, you must refuse to speak with regard or respect to want. Now what that means is you don't talk about what you don't have. You don't talk about what you need. You don't talk about your needs. And that's what happens, you see, with people. That's the sin nature on people. We don't talk about God's ability. We don't talk about the harvest we got coming. We talk about what we're lacking, you know, or what we're short, and we're speaking in respect of lack. And if you're gonna do that, you'll never be able to cross over to buying without money. So one of the key, key things for you is to govern what you say. Govern the words that come out of your mouth. Again, you do not speak in respect of want. You don't speak in respect of lack. You don't speak the things that you see. You don't, right. you know, I'm not moved by the fact that I don't have the money for a car. I'm not moved by the fact that I don't have the credit to go buy a new right. car. I'm not moved Amen. by any of those things. I'm moved by what Thank I believe. You, and I believe
li God is able to give me a car. I mean, God is able to do that. We have a, a, a friend who's in the ministry, and uh, she's had untold cars uh, given to her where people would just give them to her, you know? And s s usually there's a gap, you know, between the time that she, because uh, what will happen is God speaks to her to sow her car. And that's what she'll do. She'll sew her car. And then she'll be without a car for a little while. And, um, you know, she has to be willing to do what God said, Amen. which was sew that car Amen. and believe God for a new car. Because there's going to be a time in there where she's planted her seed, but it hadn't grown up yet. And right. she's just going to be without a car for a little while. And that's what she's done. But she's gotten some beautiful cars that people have given her, you know, Amen. just extraordinary cars. In fact, I remember she had one that she said, you know, I, I, somebody gave her a, a car and she said, you know, I had to get rid of that car. She said, because the people in my church, they saw me driving that car. And oh, they, the ministry. They, well, she and, was she, yeah, she was in the traveling ministry at the time. She said, I got to where I could not travel in that car because they, people thought, well, I didn't need any money because I'm driving an expensive automobile. And they had no idea that I had sewn my automobile and had to walk for a while until, you know, I, I, until God gave me a new, new car. So the process, and sometimes it may involve a little bit of discomfort in that sowing and reaping process. You know, there could easily be a little bit of discomfort that's involved in that. And, you know, but it's also uncomfortable to not have a car. It's also uncomfortable to have a jalopy or something like that. You're just right. constantly breaking down or you got to repair or those kinds of things. All of those things are uncomfortable as well. So, you know, there's a process that you're going to have to, to go through. Now, which leads us, let's go back. Let's go to this, this business of confession or the business of governing your words or speaking over it. And let's turn, we'll turn to Romans chapter 4 uh, because this is the, this is, uh, the foundational scripture concerning your words, and um, and we'll go to um, seventeen, chapter seventeen. Uh, I'm sorry, verse seventeen, Romans chapter four, verse seventeen. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead. In other words, the word quicken means to make not just to make alive but to make it especially alive. And uh, like, for example, we say, well, we cut our finger to the quick, you know, meaning it really, really hurt because it got down there where that nerve was and it really, really hurt. That's what the word quicken means. So quicken the dead, meaning make something live that wasn't living before. It's a foundational principle in buying without money that you want to create something that didn't exist before in your life. And the only way that happens when, supernaturally is when God quickens that thing that did not exist. He quickens your idea. He yes. quickens your Amen. confession. He quickens your desire. He quickens your belief. And he Amen. makes alive that which was not alive before. So he quickeneth the dead, and he called those things which be not as though they were. And it says, Abraham, against hope, believed in hope. The biblical word hope is, uh, means expectation. It doesn't, we, we think of the word hope in the context of wish, but the biblical word hope means expectation. What that scripture means is that he hoped in his spirit against the natural hope. In other words, he had no natural hope of Amen. producing the thing that God had promised him. So his hope had to be in the spirit. His expectation Amen. had to be in the spirit. That's one of the keys to buying without money, that you don't have a natural expectation that that thing's going to pass. Your expectation is God's going to make it happen Amen. for me. God's going to bring that. God's going to bring that thing to pass for me. So against hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to God's promise, and not being weak in faith. In other words, it's going to require, you know, it's going to require you to build your faith. It's going to require you to exercise your faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what did God say about it? What, does, what is God's promise over you? Not being weak in faith, he considered not the circumstances. Amen. He considered not Amen. the fact that you were walking for a while. You didn't even have the money to buy gas, let alone buy a car. Right. You know, He considered yes. not the natural circumstances 
he staggered not at the promise of God, meaning he didn't think it was impossible to perform. See, there's a there's a place of belief. There's a place of coming into the to the to the to the, to the, the resting assurance that God is able to do what you're believing. Our God is able to do what you're believing Him to do. One, He wouldn't have said you could buy without money if He was not able to help you buy without money. But He said that you could, and if He said that you could, He means exactly what He said. Meaning, it is possible. You got to do it His way. You operate according to His laws, and he, and and then He gets involved in it, and He makes that thing happen. So he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what God promised, he was also able to do. He's fully persuaded. Therefore, he got what he, what he was believing for. He, he, he got what he was believing for. So those are some of the, the, tr the real elements in uh, buying, buying without money. And I think, you know, in the... Uh, what we're going to do here is is uh, we're going to try to hold these sessions to maybe like a 30 minute session. So uh, because I appreciate that people, you know, they listen to them when they're driving to work or, uh, you know, they listen to them when they have a few minutes here, or a few minutes there. So we're going to try to make sure we break it up into segments so that it'll, you know, you can listen to one after the other after the other. And they will be on our Covenant Christian Center YouTube channel. So you'll be able to pick all those up on that YouTube but I thought what uh, what I would do is uh, uh, is give you a, just a couple of examples of situations, you know, so that you see how that process works. When uh, Gail and I were called to the ministry, when the Lord spoke to us uh, to go into the ministry, start the ministry, we we are we, we thought, well, what we'll do is we'll rent a, a like a hotel ballroom or something, and that's where we'll do our meetings. And so we did. We started with a wasn't um, in a ballroom. It's an a, a inappropriate description for what it really it was. It's more like, it's, 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 we started at a country club and used one of their meeting rooms, you know? Only, we didn't ever think about this, but they didn't really want us to be there. I mean, they wanted business meetings where the people were going to spend money. And our people didn't really spend any money there. They just went to the meeting, you know? So their thought was, we don't want to rent to this guy if we can rent to a meeting. So they would only rent to us if it was unoccupied on the day we wanted it. It was very difficult to plan ahead, and we realized this is not conducive to uh, furthering a ministry because faith comes by hearing, and the people need to hear on a regular basis, and we need to preach on a regular basis. Yes. So we set up uh, our, our we set up a, 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 a small meeting facility in a building that we own. And, uh, but we needed chairs. And so what happened is at the time our finances were constrained and we re didn't really have any money to go buy the chairs. And had we gone and bought the chairs, what would have happened is we would have, something else would have had to suffer, you know? And I knew that God had called us to the ministry and that if he was gonna call us to the ministry, he was going to provide what we needed for, for the ministry. It wasn't, we weren't gonna to have to dig that out of our pocket Amen. or scratch around and find the money. He was actually going, Amen. he would produce that. So I began to call in chairs. I began to believe God for, for chairs. I began to pray about them. I began to make my confession that God was gonna provide the chairs that we need. I prayed over those chairs, and God, I thank you, Lord God, that you called us to the ministry, and you know that we need chairs. So we're willing to do the ministry. We're willing to meet. We're going to pay the meeting room price. You know, we're going to we're going to pay the expenses of the meeting, but we need chairs, and I need you to produce those chairs. And so, as I'm praying, the Lord spoke to me. He said, "Why don't you call this guy?" You know, it was a guy that I knew, and uh, he was a minister. And so I called him, and he said, we, we were talking, and I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he said, well, you know, he said, I got this problem. He said, I got all these chairs that I don't have anything to do with. He said, we're, we're building a new sanctuary. And he said, we, we have the chairs for the new sanctuary, but we don't have any place to put them. So he said, I've got them in people's garages. I've got them in people's storage sheds. I've got them sitting out in the weather covered by by uh, tarps and so forth. And he said, i got to do something with my chairs. I said, well, I can help there. 
So we used his chairs for, he let us use his chairs. We used his chairs for two years. And um, it was wonderful. God provided those chairs. And uh, so we used those chairs for two years. And at the end of two years, our financial situation had improved and we were able to buy the chairs and it just wasn't a big deal. And we go on from there. Here's a real key to what happened there was that we knew that God had called us to the ministry and that if he had called us to the ministry, he would help produce that which we needed for the ministry. Same way with the business. If God called you to the business, he's going to provide what you need for a business. His intention is not to leave his people, you know, without help, but it's to help and to sustain and to prosper and to take care of. That's part, that's our covenant. That's who we are. We're, we're, we have a covenant keeping God whose desire is to provide for us and to take care of us. And if you don't believe that, you'll never be able to buy without money. You, you've got to believe that. But what happened was it affirmed that we were doing what God wanted us to do. God got involved in it. God got the chairs for us. We got every, everything Amen. we needed. It reaffirmed God's call to the ministry. It reaffirmed that we were doing what we were supposed to be doing. And it reaffirmed that God was with us in the process. That's a powerful thing. Because, see, the whole process of buying without money, if you're buying without money, it's going to be supernaturally determined. How It's going to operate by the realm of the supernatural. And the realm of the supernatural, you want to know that God is with you. If there's something that you're believing for that's not what God had for you, you don't want it. And I'll tell you, so we'll lead you, let me, let, let's go to the next situation. So let me tell you, give you one other situation that we'll in for tonight. We were, we were going to build a, a, a house, and we didn't have the money to build a house. We had the, you know, it, it was an expensive, it was an expensive home. It was a beautiful, beautiful home we were going to build on the ocean. And uh, we had no money to build the home. So the question was, how could we get that done without money? So we struggled and struggled, and as hard as I'd struggled trying to get it done and praying over it and believing God over it, I, we just couldn't quite get there, you know, and there was just a gap. And uh, so Gail and I went to uh, a camp meeting. Uh, we, we decided we were going to go away for a few days. We were going to go to a camp meeting that Crepo Dollar was having uh, in Atlanta and that we would spend a few days there in, in the camp meeting. And while we were sitting there, while we we're sitting there waiting for the service to start, the Lord spoke to me and he said, you know, he said, you're working on this thing. You're trying to figure out how to get this thing going. He said, and you're a smart man. He said, maybe you'll figure it out. Maybe you'll figure out how to do it. He said, but then you'll never know if I was in it or not. He said, you'll never know that this was of me. If, if, if you put up the money, if you find the money, if you find the money, you will never know that I was in it. He said, why don't you let me see if I can do it? And he said, if, if I can get it done for you, then you'll know I was with you. And he said, if I can't, he said, you don't want to be in it. If I'm not in it with you, you don't want to be in it anyway. And I appreciated the truth of that. And, and, and I went away that day with a, just a weight lifted off my shoulders. Because in my mind at that point, it didn't matter whether we got it or not. I wanted for us to do it. I wanted to build that house. But I wanted to know more that God was with us in that. Because if we were doing something that God wasn't right. with us in, we were going to be in real trouble anyway. Amen. You know? And so, anyway, so that's what happened. And so, lo and behold, supernatural things began to happen. And this situation happened. And that thing happened. And we got bright ideas. And, you know, God gave us supernatural wisdom over how to handle the transaction. Supernatural ideas. And everything came together. And I didn't really need any money to do it. <laughs> It was a remarkable. It was a. It was a remarkable thing, but it was. It was a, the principle. The principle that you want to engage God in the things that you do. You. You don't want to just be out there all by your own, uh, own lonesome, doing whatever you thought you wanted to do. You want God to be with you in those processes, and particularly in buying without money, where He's with you in that process. Then you know you're going in the right direction. That's where you, you want to go from there. Anyway, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. That was session one. Join, you can join us. You know, you can pick up session two here shortly. We thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I think you're going to find this to be an interesting study because it really does work. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see you tomorrow.